Some of you forgot to spring forward this morning, but I'm proud of the ones that did. <laughs> okay, I have a few announcements. Um, I was told by Pat that I'm not allowed to mention my birthday anymore, but I'm just going to ignore him. <laughs> May 12th. May 12th is my birthday. <laughs> In case anybody was wondering. <laughs> Okay, um, a few announcements. Our midweek Bible study continues this Wednesday. Starts at 6 p.m. for a light meal, but I've been told it's not really a light meal. It's like a feast. <laughs> so come hungry. <laughs> and then fellowship and 6.30 worship starts and the teaching. So if you would like to serve with the Wednesday night hospitality team, you can contact Dee and her, <clears throat> excuse me, her information is in your bulletin. And then children's ministry, as always, we need some volunteers. And like George said last Sunday, we need kids. <laughs> so <laughs> kids and volunteers. <laughs> if you're um, interested, you can see me or Anne or even Debbie. She's not here today. But when she is here, you can go find her and talk to her about it. And then our Women's Bible Fellowship continues a study by Jen Wilkin titled Better, a study of Hebrews. It's Thursday mornings and evenings. 9.30 a.m. and 6.30 p.m. here in person, as well as 6.30 p.m. on Zoom. And then finally, there is a ladies crafting group, ladies only, no men allowed, um, <laughs> Wednesday afternoons at 1 p.m. here. All right, and that's it. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Well, if you all stand up. Well, Debbie's not here this morning because she's at a bridal shower. Yeah. If uh, some of you remember Seth, the little guy, well, now he's this big, and he's getting married this Saturday coming, so we're excited for him. So just keep them in prayer, Seth and Caroline, as they start their new life together, you know, so. 
All right, if you have your Bibles, go ahead and turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 28. 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18 through 28. For the word of the cross is folly to those who are perishing, but to us who are being saved, it is the power of God, for it is written, I will destroy the wisdom of the wise and the discernment of the discerning I will thwart. Where is the one who is wise? Where is the scribe? Where is the debater of this age? Has not God made foolish the wisdom of the world? For since in the wisdom of God, the world did not know God through wisdom. It pleased God through the folly of what we preach to save those who believe. For Jews demand signs and Greeks seek wisdom. But we preach Christ crucified, a stumbling block to Jews and folly to Gentiles. But to those who are called, both Jews and Greeks, Christ the power of God and the wisdom of God. For the foolishness of God is wiser than man, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. For consider your calling, brothers. Not many of you were wise according to worldly standards. Not many were powerful. Not many were of noble birth. But God chose what is foolish in the world to shame the wise. God chose what is weak in the world to shame the strong. God chose what is low and despised in the world, even things that are not, to bring to nothing things that are. Father, we thank you, Lord, for the wisdom that we do have in Christ Jesus. And Lord, the world doesn't know about the power and the importance, Lord, of the cross. All they see is the, the folly of it, Lord, as your word says. But it is because of the cross, Lord, that we today walk in your grace. And we thank you, Lord, that we have wisdom through your son, Jesus, Lord. Father, we ask now that you would bless our time, Lord, in our giving. Lord, that what we give to you, Lord, that you would be glorified. We thank you, Lord, for the many blessings that you have bestowed upon us in our homes, in our personal lives, but also for this church family. We thank you for all the good things that you are doing. And Lord, may this church, Lord, continues to be a herald, Lord, of the good news of Jesus Christ, Lord. Lord, that is the most precious and most the best thing that we could ever do, Lord, and that what we can offer the world it is the cross of Jesus Christ. So we pray this, Lord, in Jesus' name. Amen. Yeah. 
I was like, it just went on, you know? What is it? Jesus. He fulfilled all of it. He already made the promises, so yes. I know, right? <laughs> Come on. You give the guy a microphone, <laughs> and he can't help but my talk about the joy of the Lord. <laughs> Amen? My birthday's in September. <laughs> Oh, 
is fading. The end draws near, and my time has come. Still, my soul will sing your praise unending. Ten thousand years, and then forever.
Yes, I worship your God, thank you for that promise, Lord, that, uh, and we recognize, God, that sometimes uh, our lives and the world can be filled with chaos and uncertainty and craziness, Lord, and uh, we thank you, God, that you never give up on us, you never give up on the world, the only reason you're waiting, God, is so that more people will come to you, and God, we know that at some point in time, God, we look back. And all the craziness that's going on right now, we look back and we go, wow, God was through all of that. 
Wow. Wow. That's the evidence. We thank you for that, Lord. Thank you for your presence in our lives. Thank you for being here this morning. Thank you, God, that you put up with us. And thank you, Lord, for your mercy, your kindness, your unrelenting pursuit. God, of each one of us, Lord. We thank you for these things. And your hand be upon us this morning as we celebrate you in Jesus' name. All God's people said, amen. amen. All right, so go ahead and stand and greet each other. And... Uh, We'll have the service in a second. Good morning. Good morning. <clears throat> I love that last song. That's a bit, bit much, Dave. Bring it down a little bit. Um, there's so much evidence for the power and the love of Jesus Christ in our lives. And if you guys, I hope that when you were singing that song, well, first of all, I hope you were singing the song. <laughs> and that when you were singing the song, I hope that your brain was just going through all the evidence in your own personal life of the things that he's done for you. Amen? Amen. That's just amazing. And evidence is important. It's because our faith in Jesus Christ is based on the person of Jesus Christ. It's not an intellectual exercise. It's not a philosophical exercise. It's the evidence of Jesus Christ when he walked the earth and in our lives right now. The evidence is clear. It's awesome. And there's other evidence this week that, that just uh, thrilled me. Uh, first of all, the fact that those of you that are here in bodily form right now... <laughs> That's an evidence right there. I mean, that wasn't easy this morning, right? How many of you set your clocks back or forward last night? How many of you totally forgot about it? Ah, okay. I don't know what that means if you forgot. Uh, if you're watching online thinking that you got away with something, no, I'm just, I, no. No, I'm really glad you're watching online. I really am. The Word of God is powerful, and He's not confined to any one space. Um, the other evidence that just thrilled me this week was uh, that, if you recall last week, I, I talked about um, Ukraine relief. And so many of you responded that we're going to be sending over $2,000 worth of aid to a church in... Ukraine. Just, it's for Christians there that are helping people survive this. It's, it's a, a beautiful thing to see and be a part of a fellowship that is generous, that, that wants to be a friend when there are people that are in need. And uh, uh, you guys just have no idea. When I saw 
the results of that, it just really brought tears to my eyes. So I'm, I'm just uh, really, really grateful that you heard the message. And for those of you that um, didn't maybe hear the instructions last week, just go on our website. It's all there. You can write a check to this church uh, and just put Ukraine relief at the bottom, or you can go through push pay, and there's a Ukraine relief button that you can push. And then we send it directly to a church um, via, well, actually it goes into Indianapolis and then goes to Ukraine. Um, but it's, uh, it's, a, it's really, really needed right now. And uh, there's just uh, an opportunity for you to serve the Lord this way, because that's how we do it. We serve the Lord in our giving, in our worship, in all kinds of things. So I'm just really happy about all of that. There's joy in my heart. Um, well, let's pray, and then we'll get into God's Word this morning. Father, we thank you. Thank you for the evidence in our lives for who you are and how you are working in each and every one of us. Lord, we thank you for your Word. Lord, that we can go to your Word and how amazing it is, how timely it always is, Lord, that your Word is just incredible, that we can go to your word and by your Holy Spirit it just comes alive and we see how relevant and important it is for us to know what it is that you have to say to your saints. So Lord, I pray right now as we do get into your word that you would guide and direct everything that I have to say that it would be what it is that you would want each and every one of us to hear, that your Holy Spirit would work through me, Lord. Because we didn't come to hear me, Lord. We've come to hear you. So, Lord, I just thank you for that. I pray that everything that we do here glorifies you. We pray this in the mighty, mighty name of Jesus and all God's children said, amen, amen. 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 Ephesians chapter 5. I'm going to read uh, from verse 15 to verse 17. Paul writes... Look carefully, then, how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of the time, because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the word of the Lord is. That's just three verses, but boy... We could take a long time on those verses, and I'm only going to take a few hours, so <laughs> we're good. We've been looking at Ephesians the last few weeks, and Paul's been telling us, describing for us what Christian living is all about, because Christian living is not about living the way the world says we're supposed to live. It's a whole different panorama of understanding. He talked about that we should be walking in love, walking in love. And every time he uses the term walking, he's really talking about living so that our lives should be about love, love that's, that's agape love, love that's unconditional love, love that reaches out to people that are in need, as you guys have done so well. And he talks about Walking in the light, be children of light, meaning being children of God's light, God's life. So walking in love, walking in light, and then today he's saying, walk in wisdom, walk in wisdom. All three of these, as I was praying over this again this morning, all three of these, the walking in love, the walking in light and the walking in wisdom. Who does that remind you of? Anybody? Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> if I ask you a question, the answer is always Jesus. <laughs> okay, I know it's early. We are worshiping Jesus. Walking in love, walking in light, and today, walking in wisdom reminds us of Jesus. Jesus. Amen. Amen. <laughs> There'll be a quiz afterwards just to see if you can retain for 30 minutes. 
<laughs> oh, you know me too well. Jesus has changed us. He's changed us by his grace. He's changed us from the inside out. Not from the outside in, but from the inside out. Meaning that he's changed our heart. He's, op- he's given us eyes to see, ears to hear. He's changed us. And then he helps us by arming us with his word. His word is so important. So now, because of that, we are to be different. We are different already from the inside out. We are different. You're going to find yourself, and I know you all have, oh, I'm not that person. I'm a new person. I'm a changed person. Sometimes it's incrementally changed. Sometimes it's monumentally changed. But we're changed. And the change sometimes can be very, very difficult because there are forces, spiritual forces in this world that are working against you. But he is, but Jesus has overcome all of that. Overcome all of that. So we're not to be conformed to this world. We're to be in the world, but we're not to be conformed to the world, but to be transformed. Be transformed, as Paul says in Romans, by the renewing of our minds. By the renewing of our minds. To live out the grace that God has given us and brought to us. We looked last week at verses 8 to 14. And you remember that Paul, Paul said to us, remember. He said, remember what we were. Remember what we were. Without God's grace, we were something else. Without that regenerating work of the Holy Spirit in us, what were we? We were darkness. He didn't say we were living in darkness. He said we were darkness. And some of us loved that darkness a lot. We were darkness. But by the grace of God, we've been raised to a new life a whole new life, a whole new journey of life. And we're now, he says, children of the Lord's light. Children of the Lord's light. And so therefore, he says now in verse 15, he says, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise. Not as unwise. It's it's. But as wise, it's such a simple message. He says, walk in wisdom. Walk in wisdom. Wisdom. I don't know what you think about it when I say the word wisdom. What does that mean to you? First thing that occurs to me is that if you have the kind of wisdom that he's talking about, it's a gift from God to you. He's given you the wisdom. You didn't manufacture it. You had another kind of wisdom. But now he's given you a gift by his grace, and that gift is wisdom. Wisdom. He's made you wise. You're thinking, I don't feel that wise. Maybe you do feel wise. I don't know. It's a monumental thing to have the wisdom of God working in you. Monumental. Wisdom, I I was thinking about this in terms of what's going on in this world right now and what's been going on in this world with plagues and then wars and so many things happening. We really desperately need wisdom. The timeliness of God's word is just exemplified as we look around the world and we say, where is their wisdom? Show me a leader who's got wisdom. Think about it. Anna and I were going through a list of leaders as we went on our walk yesterday. I'm not going to give you the names. You know the names. And I said, where's the wisdom? Where is the wisdom? 
We need wisdom. It's hugely important in our lives. We need it every day. The first third in, in the men's group on Friday nights, we're going through the book of Proverbs. And men, if you haven't given up a Friday night and come here, you're missing out. There's pizza. <laughs> and there's also the Word of God studied in depth. A lot of interaction. A really a great time in the Lord. Friday night, 6.30, right here. The first third of the book of Proverbs focuses on wisdom. We went through it chapter after chapter after chapter. Because God wants us to understand how important wisdom is. He says in, in Proverbs 9, verse 10, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. That verse is going to set us on a path here this morning. And the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. So here's the greatest wisdom that you will ever hear right there. Believe that Jesus is the Son of God, that He is the Messiah, and that He came here to this earth. And when he was here, he displayed the wonder of God. He displayed the power of God. He, he displayed the compassion and the love of God. When you know that, you are on the path of the beginning of wisdom. Without that, you have no wisdom. Without that knowledge, without that faith, you have no wisdom. Knowing that Jesus is the Son of God, when you know it in your heart, when you know it deeply in your inner being, and you're praising Him every day, and you're praying to Him every day, and you're walking with Him in love, and you're walking with Him in His light, and you're walking with Him in wisdom, there is no greater life-giving wisdom that has no equal than that knowledge. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, and the knowledge of the Holy One is insight. That verse will mean nothing to you unless you believe Jesus Christ is your Lord and Savior. But when you believe it, you will rejoice in the fear of the Lord and the knowledge of the Holy One. But guess what? To the unsaved world... To the unbelieving world, what I just said is complete foolishness. Why bother? What is that? But God has made the world's wisdom foolishness. Manny just read from, from 2 Corinthians. It's beautiful. Once, before we accepted Jesus... We were foolish. We thought we were wise. We thought we had it together. No. We were, we were foolish. We were apart from Christ. But God gave you faith by his grace. And now, because of what he's done in you, you possess the greatest wisdom there is. He's made you wise. Live that way now. Now live that way. Now walk in wisdom. Paul says it this way in 2 Timothy, verses, uh, 2 Timothy 3, verse 15. He says, You have known the Holy Scriptures, which are able to make you wise for salvation. Through faith, which is in Christ Jesus. Literally, 
It's saying that the scriptures have led you by the Spirit to faith in Jesus, and that faith is your wisdom. You were once in darkness, but now you are the children of the light of the Lord. Wisdom has no place in spiritual darkness. Wisdom is light. Wisdom is, in biblical terms, referring, when it says wisdom is light, it's referring to the Holy Spirit working in you. It's the Holy Spirit, God's Holy Spirit, that has made us wise and is continuing to teach us more and more about Jesus. And as he continues by his word to, to teach us more and more about Jesus, we have more wisdom. The closer we draw to Jesus, the more wisdom we have. The more we trust in Jesus, the more wisdom we have. The more we seek his face, the more wisdom we have. It's that whole process of going to Jesus, drawing close to Jesus. That's wisdom. That's how we live our lives as Christians. But the world thinks Christians are foolish. The world thinks it's foolish to submit to the will of God. That it's foolish to trust in Christ alone for salvation. That it's foolish to hope for life eternal in Jesus Christ. Nevertheless, God says to us, I have made you wise because you have faith. I sent you my son. I sent you my son. I sent him here for you so that you would have true wisdom. Why? Because he is true wisdom. Jesus is the wisdom of God and the power of God. He is your only hope. You might have a a really good self-improvement plan book somewhere on your shelf. It won't do you any good. It won't give you wisdom. You might lose 10 pounds, but you'll gain 20 later. (laughs) But by the grace of the Holy Spirit, our eyes have been opened. And we see the one who is perfect. We see the one who bore our sin. And so our guilt, because of what he did on the cross, you guys, our guilt has been dealt with. I don't know about you, but that, I go to that a lot. I'm so glad I don't have to wallow in my guilt. He took it all to the cross. He took the penalty of sin. He dealt with it all so that the power of sin has no longer a dominion over us, so that we're no longer a slave to whatever sin that was in our lives, or many sins, maybe. As you walk in wisdom, you put all your hopes in him. That's walking in wisdom. Whatever it is, you put all your hope. You've rested in him. You've trusted in him. And God says, because you do that, I number you amongst the wise. He didn't start off wise. I didn't start off wise. Kind of a wise something something, but not wise. (laughs) Oh, how you guys can just understand what I'm talking about. (laughs) We We were not inherently wise. We were not born wise. No. But God, in his wisdom, has made You and me wise in Jesus Christ. Without Jesus, you're not wise, so don't get a big head about it, right? Be humble. So let's behave like wise people, which means that we're walking in the love of Jesus Christ, which means we're walking walking in the light of Jesus Christ. James says it this way. I love James. Chapter 3, verse 13, he says, Who is wise? Who is wise and understanding among you? It's like 
Imagine him up here saying to you, who amongst you is wise and has understanding? By his good conduct, let him show his works in the meekness of wisdom. It's a mouthful, isn't it? James, <laughs> is, he's such a great part of the New Testament because he's kind of like the show me Christian. You got to show me, right? <laughs> works, I mean, faith without works is dead, he says. Show me. He says, so you know the scriptures? Don't tell me about it. Show me. Show me how you live by the scriptures. Then I'll believe that you understand it. How are you walking in the scriptures? How are you taking it and being obedient? You, have, you say you have wisdom? You say you've got understanding? Show me that wisdom. Show me that understanding. Show it to me in how you live. Not just when I'm watching, but when you're just by yourself. Wisdom in the Bible. It's not a theoretical, intellectual, ivory tower thing. That's not wisdom. That's not wisdom in the Bible. Wisdom in the Bible is a very practical thing. And ultimately in the Bible, wisdom is never understood. It's never grasped to be known until it's lived out. Okay? So we can all say, yes, I accept Jesus as my Lord and Savior. Now am I walking and living that way? Am I living in him? Is he my constant companion in my heart? Until you do that, you're not wise. Wisdom isn't that you know something and then just put it up on the shelf. Wisdom goes beyond knowing the facts of the Bible. That's what I mean when I'm saying it's practical. It's not just knowing the facts of the Bible. It's not just knowing the Scripture, which we want to know and must know. But it's allowing the Holy Spirit to work in you to illuminate in you and to bring the truth of who Jesus is into your inner being. And then you're changed from the inside out. And then you can apply it. And then your heart has been changed. And then when you meet and come face-to-face -face with difficult circumstances, then you can walk in wisdom. Then you can live the way Jesus would have you to live. Respond the way he would have you to respond. It's knowing and believing and desiring and doing the truth. The doing part is really important. So the Apostle Paul is saying, Christian, You've been made wise by the grace of God. Now live out that wisdom. Be a living testimony to the world because it's a dark world. And when you're out there as a living testimony for Jesus, there is a light that goes out. And this dark world needs that light. It needs his light. Then Paul says in verse 16 of Ephesians 5, he says, make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Fascinating verse. Make the best use of the time because the days are evil. Being wise means you're a realist. You understand that the days are evil. It means something. It means, when we say the days are evil, what does that really mean? It means that there's a spirit active in this world, and it's a bad spirit. It means that there's an outlook of this age that is evil. Remember in Genesis, I love this, Jacob 
meets with Pharaoh. He's 130 years old, and he's sojourned all the way to Pharaoh. And he says to Pharaoh in Genesis 47, verse 9, he says, The days of the years of my sojourning are 130 years. Few and evil have been the days of the years of my life. And they have not attained to the days of the years of the life of my fathers in the days of their sojourning. He looks back on his life. And he sees the workings of evil against him and in him. If you know Jacob, he's an interesting man. He's saying, the days of my life have been hard. He's saying that I've lived in a fallen world. And so, brothers and sisters, it takes the word of God. It takes the word of God to understand things, assess things as they really are. And Paul says, we are to be making the best use of our time in the context of the evil days in which we live. Jesus knew this. Jesus knew this. And he came to defeat evil. But he did it in a way that to the world, and even us, is mysterious. He did it in a way that confounds the wisdom of the world. He defeated evil at the cross. He redefined what true power is at the cross. He suffered there, and he died there, and he used his power to serve others, not to control others. His great power was sacrificial love. He changed everything by the power of his love. This is the true power of God. In no other way could evil or sin or death be defeated. And in these evil days in which we live right now, God is turning all things to the good for those who love God and are called according to his purposes right now. Brothers and sisters, he's called us to defeat evil as we walk in love, as we walk in the light, as we walk in wisdom. It's counterintuitive to what the world is telling us. Completely the opposite. We defeat evil when we glorify God. You understand that? We defeat evil when we glorify God. It's how we are to live out our days. Because really, we're not really made for this fallen world. We're made for the new heavens and the new earth. I can't wait for that day. It's a day when this world will be cleansed. It's a day when evil will be eradicated and the new heavens and the new earth will have been brought in. Until then, however, we need to make the most of our time I love the way the King James Version talks about this. It says, redeem the time. Redeem the time. Use your time wisely. Those of us that are getting a little older understand how important time is. When you're young, like Pastor Wade, you think you have all the time in the world. What does it mean? What does it mean to redeem the time? You hear people, have you ever heard someone say, well, time is money. No, it's not. (laughs) Time is not money. Because money cannot buy you time. Money is worthless for your time. 
Time, in fact, is our greatest commodity. <laughs> Not money. If you have all the money in the world but no time, what good is it? <laughs> we can't add to our time. We can't stretch it out. I, I think I want this day to be 48 hours, not 24 hours. You can't do it. It's fixed, and it's fixed for everybody. Paul's saying that each of us, when he's saying redeem the time, he's saying each of us is living in a season of opportunity. You have an opportunity that God has given us time. He's given us time. Here on earth, he's given us time. Seize the opportunity to serve Jesus. Here's, here's a promise. If you're feeling low, if you're feeling unfulfilled, if you're feeling like something I need to, it's just not working, find a place to serve. Your life will change. Your life will change. And I don't, I don't know how to tell you how to serve. That's between you and the Lord. But if you really want a, a, a sense that you are walking in wisdom, that you are walking in love, that you are walking in life, and that that is fulfilling you in a way you've never felt before, that you need more of, find a place to serve. Find a way to serve. I hope you understand that. Seize the opportunity to serve Jesus. Seize the opportunity wherever it comes. And some of you are, are really good at understanding very quickly, oh, I'm, I'm standing in line at the grocery store, and this person behind me is being obnoxious. That's an opportunity to serve Jesus. Some of you get that. I don't claim to get it, but some of you get it. <laughs> Be wise and glorify God. We sang this song uh, Friday night. Pat, I was almost going to ask him to sing it again today, but... I don't want to tell him what to do. <laughs> but there's this verse that repeats, be glorified, God. 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 Can you say that with me? Be glorified, God, in what we do and how we live. Be glorified, God. That ought to be your opening prayer when you, when you woke up early this morning. God, it's too early. No, don't say that. <laughs> say, be glorified, God, in what I'm going to do today. He's given you time, deciding that everything that I am, everything that I have, is given to him. Given to him. So that all of my time, not just Sunday time, not just church time, but all of my time be used to glorify God. Moses, pretty wise man. He says in Psalm 90, verse 12, he says, so teach us to number our days. Teach us to number our days that we may get a heart of wisdom. That's where true wisdom is found, is in the heart. But he says, teach us. Teach us. It means that his wisdom, that God's wisdom must be learned. We must be taught. A wise person knows that we only have so much time. And to make the most of it, making the most of it in glorifying God in our jobs or our families or our homes, our friends, God knows God knows where you are at all times. He knows your circumstances. And he will show you a way. He will show you a way to do his work in your work. To do his work during your day. Whatever your day is. Whatever it involves. I mentioned this last week. 
Your work, whatever it may be, is a form of your worship. God's calling you, and he's calling me to use our time for his kingdom. That's true wisdom. Finally, he says in verse 17, Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. What do you think about that? The wisdom of the Lord, wisdom is knowing and wanting and loving and doing the will of God. You want to be wise? Do the will of God. Jesus understood this perfectly in his incredible prayer for God's will in his prayer at Gethsemane. On the night before the cross, you want to talk about a difficult circumstance. And he says this in Matthew 24, beginning in verse 36. Jesus went with them to a place called Gethsemane. And he said to his disciples, sit here while I go over there and pray. And taking with him Peter and the two sons of Zebedee, he began to be sorrowful and troubled. Then he said to them, my soul is very sorrowful, even to death. He says, remain here and watch with me. And then going a little farther, he fell on his face and he prayed saying, my father, if it be possible, let this cup pass from me. And then he says, nevertheless, not as I will, but as you will. He wanted his will to be completely fused with the Father's will. That should be your prayer. That should be each of our prayers. The Lord Jesus did not just pray that prayer just for himself that night, I believe. I believe that he also prayed that prayer for us because we've been reading that scripture for over 2,000 years. Not my will, but your will. Not my will, but your will. That's the, the will of the Lord. Always seek to submit yourself, your heart, to God's will. He instructed his disciples. He says this in teaching them to pray. He says in Matthew 6, verse 9, Pray then like this, Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Your will be done in me. Your will be done in me. You want happiness? Know the will of God for you in your life. That's our daily prayer. God's will all the time in our hearts. So the wise man, the wise woman knows and loves and desires and wants and does the will of God. We, we need to be delighting in doing the will of God. And it's not always easy. It wasn't easy for Jesus that night. Nothing is more important, though, in your life. Nothing is more important in your life than to know the one who is wise in, li in life than knowing God's will. Nothing is more important than that. Am, am I living today, right now, in the will of God? Or am I doing my own thing? Very different. Am I embracing God's will? If you're not sure, pray. God, help me. It's a good prayer. God, help me. Help me to do your will. Give me wisdom to know your will in this thing that I'm doing right now, whatever it is. He loves the details of your life. Give it to him. As we seek the wisdom from God, we realize that ultimately God's will for us, for his children, for his people, is to make us like Jesus, I told you 30 minutes and I was going to ask you the question. <laughs> Romans 8, 
Verse 29. He predestined. Those that he predestined, he called to be conformed to the image of his son. That's God's will for your life, to be conformed to the image of Jesus. So we know that all day, that every day, he is committed, God is committed to making us more like Jesus. He's working in you right now for that exact purpose. That is his will for you. I don't care who you are. That's why he says in Ephesians 1 verse 4, he chose us in him before the foundations of the world that we should be holy and blameless before him. That's where all of this leads. This walking in love leads to Jesus. This walking in light leads to Jesus. This walking in wisdom leads to Jesus. It all leads to becoming more and more and more like him. More and more and more. Becoming more like Jesus. And as we do this, we find ourselves being more and more different than the world. Jesus said this, and he exemplified this really in, in Philippians 2, verse 80. Uh, Paul says, and being found in human form, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. And then verse 9 of Philippians 2, he says, Therefore God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every other name. Incredible verses. The Son of God was rejected and condemned and tortured and executed, and then God raised and exalted him. That's stunning to me. God raised and exalted him after all of that. Jesus came to serve, he said, not to be served. He said, the first shall be the last. He will be, his life, the life of Jesus, was the ultimate refutation of the world's wisdom. He came to save the world. He came to save the world. But he was born in a manger. Not in a palace. He was born in obscurity. He never got involved in powerful politics. I love that scene where he's standing in front of Herod and he just won't even say a word. He was killed in his early 30s. He never wrote a book. And yet, the gospel is read and preached throughout the world for 2,000 years. People from all conditions of life, all classes of life, have found peace in the gospel found power in the gospel of Jesus. The world's not going to tell you that. But the evidence, as we sang, the evidence is clear in your life and in my life. Poor people, uneducated people, as well as affluent people. We gather in homes, we gather in churches, we gather in coffee shops to talk about Jesus. Let's keep doing it while we still can. Lives are changed. And yet, he never said, he never said this, so different than the world. He never said, come to me because I'm really strong and I'm really brilliant and just pull yourself together and be like me. No, he never said that. He exchanged places with you. He exchanged places with me on the cross. He came to live like you and I should live. And he came to die the death that you and I should have died. 
But he did all of that so that we could be reconciled to God, so that we could be forgiven, so that we could be remade. That's the gospel message. And that's true wisdom. That's true wisdom. He was rejected by the world, and the world considered him a failure, considered him foolish. The world looks at Jesus' death as a waste of time. Right now, the world thinks we need someone to right the world. We need someone to right the world before we blow each other up. We have that one. He is our peace. And his name is Jesus. Jesus. You guys are quick. (laughs) How could he help the world? How could he help the world without becoming a great philosopher or a great teacher or a great general or a great politician or some other kind of world leader leading some big empire? How can he do all that? The world's wisdom Ask that question, seeking someone else beside him. But the world's wisdom leads to wars. The world's wisdom leads to tribulation. The world's wisdom leads to conflict and it leads to death. Here's the greatest wisdom of Jesus, guys. He says, take up your cross and follow me. Are you ready to do that? Are you ready to give up control of your life? Are you ready to give up control of your life and give it to Jesus? Are you ready to do that? Because when you do that, you're going to find wisdom. You're going to be walking in wisdom. Because the greatest glory that you will ever have in your entire life is to give away your glory for his glory. So brothers and sisters, verse 15, Ephesians 5, look carefully then how you walk, not as unwise, but as wise, making the best use of your time. Redeem the time because the days are evil. Therefore, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And the will of the Lord is to make us like Jesus. Jesus. To God be the glory forever and ever. Amen. Let's stand and let's pray. Oh, Lord, without you, there is no wisdom. Without you, there is no love. Without you, there is no light and no love, no life and no anything that is good. We need your strength. We need your guidance. We pray that your Holy Spirit would give us that strength, give us that guidance, give us the ability, Lord, to be wise to live out our wisdom, to understand that the world's wisdom is foolishness and that our faith in Jesus is our wisdom. Help us, Lord. We cannot do this on our own. We need your help. I pray for everyone within the sound of my voice today to walk in wisdom in the wisdom of Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. And I pray this in the mighty name of Jesus and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Amen.
songs of praise is singing We will worship and adore you. Songs of praise and singing. Hallelujah. What a powerful message this morning. Please bow your hearts with me. Father, you have so many ways of ministering to us. Sometimes it's very convicting. Father, sometimes it's just joyful, even in the conviction. We pray, Lord, that we will follow you, that we will follow Jesus now and forevermore. And we thank you for your presence with us this morning. Let us follow Jesus. We pray in Jesus' name. And all God's children said, amen. Thank you. Amen. Remember, the evidence is all around you, right? Amen. Have an awesome week.
Shout out. 